Welcome everyone to the My Horse University in eExtension Horse Quest live webcast on biosecurity for horses. The presenter for this evening is Dr. Judy Martinuk. Judy is an Associate Professor of Equine Medicine and Extension in the Large Animal Clinical Sciences Department at Michigan State University. Originally from Canada, Dr. Martinuk received her DVM at Western College of Veterinary Medicine, University of Saskatchewan, Canada. She also received a master's degree in animal nutrition at Michigan State University. Judy practiced veterinary medicine in the field early in her career before joining the Michigan State University Large Animal Clinical Sciences Department. She educates veterinary students and works directly with clients and their horses. Her 30 plus years of experience make her a valuable member of the MSU Extension equine team. Please note to everyone who is online that you are able to ask questions during the presentation via the Q&A option in the top left corner of your screen. There will also be time at the end of pr the presentation for additional questions and we will be recording this webinar as well. And at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Judy. Thank you very much. As uh, was stated, we're going to talk about biosecurity and the way we're going to address this tonight is we're going to talk about generalities to start with and what biosecurity is. Then we'll talk about some diseases of concern and we'll finish up with some you know, practical considerations that you can think about with your equine activity. So biosecurity is you know, simply uh, a, you know, looking at you know, procedures and management practices that you can do to limit exposure to disease. These practices can limit spread of disease, you know, causing organisms from one animal to another or from one farm to another, as you know, certain uh, diseases can be extremely contagious. To have a disease, there's three important agents or things to consider. We have the animal, our horse, that you know is the one that's going to you know hopefully you know not contact you know a problem, some type of infectious agent, and the environment. And without this triad, we're not going to have disease. If your immune system is good, your animal is healthy. It's going to take a much larger uh, amount of an infectious agent to cause disease. If the uh, environment is very stressful, as those of you that are from Michigan uh, realized last week with our wonderful weather, it's going to take less you know, infectious agents to you know, cause disease just because the stress level in our animals is gonna be you know, so high. So it's important that we have our animal as healthy as we possibly can and minimize exposure to infectious agents. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about mother nature and the environment for the most part. So to try and prevent you know, problems occurring, we try to keep our vaccinations as current as possible, and that's going to include our core five vaccines of Eastern, Western, and West Nile encephalitis, and you know, tetanus, and rabies. Even though these diseases are not transmissible from horse to horse, they are transmissible you know, primarily through environmental uh, agents, such as mosquitoes and the organisms in the soil, and hence, you know, uh, other than rabies, which can be transmitted from a rabid animal to our, you know, horses and ourselves. And we're going to try and protect our horses from contacting these infectious diseases. And this comes into more of the vaccines that we don't readily you know, consider core vaccines or totally necessary, but if you have a horse that travels, you know, flu, rhino, you know, these diseases, you know, can be contacted from exposure to other horses, strangles that we'll talk about a little bit later, highly contagious. And we're gonna talk about how diseases are spread. As I mentioned already, West Nile is gonna be transmitted by mosquitoes where strangles is either contacting a horse that has uh, the agent or contacting the organism, you know, in, you know, the environment.
when you know we obtain a new horse or we have horses coming back from equine events, ideally we would like to quarantine these horses. The equine industry, however, is an industry that makes true isolation and quarantine as would be practiced with you know, other uh, species, you know, especially production animals, you know, cattle, sheep, you know, swine, much harder. Horses, by their nature of use, are constantly traveling, constantly being exposed, and not in a closed herd situation where animals don't come and go as a rule. And so this makes you know, biosecurity you know, extremely challenging. However, if at all possible, and you have the facilities, it's important to have a quarantine barn or have at least some place where you can keep animals segregated away from the main population for around 30 days. Anytime we have a, you know, a disease outbreak, typically we're looking at exceeding the incubation period for that disease. So we truly look at about 30 days of you know, quarantine or restricted admittance once that animal you know, enters the farm. We also try really hard to make sure that animals entering the farm are healthy. Maybe having you know, animals come in, uh, require having a veterinary exam, and even if you don't have a veterinary exam, any new animal coming onto your facility, you should at least visually inspect, are they appropriate weight, are they you know, bright eye, no nasal discharge, you know, feces uh, and parasite control is becoming more and more of a concern with parasite resistance, so having a fecal exam on horses prior to coming in is you know, maybe something that is warranted, as we talked about before, vaccination, making sure vaccines are up to date. If it's a barn that has a lot of horses coming and going, the respiratory diseases are important to vaccinate for. Even though those you know, diseases, the vaccine is not anywhere near 100%, kind of similar to us getting our flu vaccinations, Anything we can do to reduce the you know, potential infectious agents in the facility is really important. And then even though equine infectious anemia, EIA, is not that common anymore, especially if we're in the northern states, it does occur from time to time. And any new horses coming on the facility or horses that you recently purchased should have an equine infectious anemia test to make sure they are at least negative at you know, certain points in time. So as we you know, talked about already, you know, looking at our resident horses and making sure that their vaccination status is up to date, making sure they're as healthy as they absolutely can be so that new horses coming onto the property are not you know, more of a risk than they necessarily need to be. The, Shaded, you know, blue triangle areas are common places to vaccinate, you know, ending up in, you know, the neck area. And one of the more common things, since this is vaccination season now, is making sure we're in the middle of this triangle. A lot of times people think that the neck bones kind of run up underneath the mane here, which is not true. We have, you know, the pole and then the neck bones actually are down at the bottom side of this triangle. So it's really important to stay in the middle of this triangle if you're doing the neck for vaccinations or you know, do it in the back you know, hindquarters. Don't vaccinate up on the top part of the croup if at all possible because this is an area if we have problems it's very hard to drain. The other thing we need to think about as far as biosecurity practices is what other species are on the farm. And that may be wanted or unwanted uh, species. So our rats and mice and possums and raccoons are kind of unwanted species, and we don't want them contaminating, you know, our food sources, you know, hay and grain. You know, trying to minimize the number of these, you know, animals in the barn. But also our cats and dogs going from, you know, pen to pen or paddock to paddock can easily spread, you know, disease. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we come to strangles. Other things we need to think about and uh, when we're talking about infectious disease is fomites and probably the biggest fomite of all is 
us. We as people tend to be one of the more common ways that diseases are transmitted from you know animal to animal. We you know have our regular clothes on, our boots. Anytime you go visiting a you know a different facility, you really should not be wearing your you know clothes you normally wear at home or when you come home. You should be changing your footwear and changing your clothes just because you know organisms can you know live on your you know clothing along the same line if we do have a disease outbreak and it happens to be a zoonotic disease which means it can be transmitted from animals to people such as salmonella that we're going to talk about it's important that when you're out in the barn when you come to the house again you remove the clothing that you wore in the barn because we want to minimize the risk to uh, people in the household, especially if we have young children, people that are immunosuppressed, you know, the elderly. Tack, we all tend to share tack in brushes and uh, other equipment, especially if we're, you know, out at, you know, shows and things. And these, you know, can all transmit disease from one group of animals to another. And as we already talked about, other you know things on the farm, our cats, our dogs, you know rodents, you know the chickens that scratch from one and pick from one place to the other, our uh, pigeons and you know barn, you know swallows and well not so much swallows but uh, starlings and things in the barn, and some of these are kind of inherent risks because if you can tell me, I have not figured out how to eliminate birds from my barn. So it's, you know, one of the things we just have to realize is an inherent risk. So these are kind of some of the fomite, you know, things we can think about and often don't think about is if we borrow, you know, somebody else's bridle, you know, have you cleaned the bit off, you know, prior to, you know, using, you know, leg wraps, you know, saddles from horse to horse. Clippers, you know, time of the year where we're getting ready to, you know, show horses and especially again if you're in northern climates, trying to get them, you know, looking good for show early uh, without having to wait for the full time that they shed out. Clipper blades are a good way of transmitting, you know, problems from one horse, you know, to another. And one of the things that I'm not really talking about, you know, tonight from a biosecurity aspect is these long hair coats and clipping and everything is lice. And a number of you know, people I've talked to in the last couple of weeks are you know, talking about lice in their animals. So always you know, think about you know, am I, what am I transmitting from you know, one horse to another. Also need to consider our water and feed as possible sources of infection. And we'll talk about, you know, especially the water aspect under you know, practical considerations. When you have grain in a facility, it should be stored in something that's rodent proof, whether that's an old freezer, it's garbage cans with a lid on it. And from the standpoint, you know, not so much for biosecurity, but just for you know, safety sake for the horses, make sure those containers are unaccessible and behind uh, at least one set of barriers besides the stall. So we don't have horses, you know, getting out and getting into, you know, the feed and, you know, eating or overeating. Also, when you buy uh, bags of feed from the, you know, your feed store or your elevator, make sure the bags are intact. Don't buy bags that have been torn and potentially contaminated with, you know, rodent feces. And when we, you know, talk about this as well is, you know, thinking about, you know, equine, you know, uh, protozoal myelitis or EPM and opossums who are, you know, the definitive host and their fecal material, if it contaminates our feed, you know, just makes it more likely that our horses are going to be exposed to EPM if you're in the states where, you know, opossums exist. So now as we kind of move into certain kinds of uh, problems that we might think about with our horses. And, you know, since I'm in Michigan and this was not as big a concern when I was in private practice in Minnesota, but coming to Michigan is sand ingestion. It's not a biosecurity uh, issue per se, but 
it's really important for the health of your horse. Remember, we want that healthy horse that is more resistant to disease is to minimize sand ingestion. So making sure that all feed is fed with some type of a barrier between the feed and the ground and that we're not over grazing areas. And also this is going to prevent, you know, ingestion of parasite larva and eggs, depending upon the parasite we're, you know, concerned with. And with increasing parasite resistance, I have some, you know, farms that I have you know, worked with now that only have one anthelmintic that works. And once that anthelmintic is no longer working, there's going to be no additional drugs. So it's really important that we really manage the environment and reduce the parasite load that our horses are being exposed to. So we want to feed with, you know, and I think it's important that we feed such that the horse is eating level with its head or, you know, eating down. So whether it be in troughs or racks or nets, you know, slow grazing nets, I'm becoming more and more of a fan of a slow grazing net because it really reduces how fast horses can eat, but also reduces waste and the amount of material that ends up loose on the ground. Because as soon as you know, food is on the ground and the horse is sifting through the soil, they're picking up sand, they're picking up parasites, you know, becoming more and more of an issue from a health standpoint. Water sources you know, should be tested for coliform content, for mineral content, making sure we control runoff so we don't have a lot of ponding of material that's fecal contaminated. Another issue, we don't want our horses you know, drinking from contaminated water sources. This is probably, as I mentioned earlier, the hardest thing for horse owners to do and to have a way of controlling where horses go when they're moving on and off farms, going to shows, going to competitions, because most of us don't have the luxury of having isolation barns or multiple barns to allow us to separate you know, populations. However, we need to kind of think about you know, these aspects of um, how are we gonna control disease or minimize the risk of disease. And rather than just having a horse that leaves a boarding facility or your barn or whatever and leaving an empty stall in you know, between two brood mares or what have you, trying to make sure horses are kind of grouped by their life activity. So horses that stay home, horses that are brood mares, horses that are young horses that are very susceptible to disease, you know, showing horses are kind of all segregated to a certain area of the barn and aren't intermixed between, you know, groups. The second point here of using sterile needles and syringes, um, I wouldn't think I would have to talk about, but there's still, you know, cases of disease that occur, EIA, Babesia, where people have used the same needle on multiple horses for medications. Needles and syringes are cheap. Never should we be using the same, you know, syringe and needle on multiple horses. And if you have horses coming to your farm for short periods of time, you're having a, a weekend show or, 4-H meat or whatever, trying to keep those animals separate from your farm population. You know, whether you have temporary stalls, have paddocks that are, you know, set up, you know, for those horses, really try to keep those horses separate as much as you possibly can. Again, using separate halters and lead shanks, especially, you know, each horse should have their own, and if they don't, have it again, at least segregated for, you know, for groups of horses. So these lead shanks are used on the pregnant horses. These you know, lead shanks are used on the young horses. These lead shanks are used for the showing horses. Because remember the fomite aspect, they are gonna be contaminated with whatever those horses might have. And especially your showing group or your showing group who is often also your young group, they're like kindergarten kids. When you mix them up, they're all going to get sick, and that's just a common thing that happens. So trying to really keep that group segregated. 
uh, limiting access to barns, housing horses returning from major shows. If you have a boarding barn and a showing barn, if you're lucky enough to have that luxury of having two separate barns, people should not be, you know, going to the barn <clears throat> that has the boarding horses on a routine basis if they spend the time up in the show barn, just again because of the fomite issue. And especially for brood mares, there's a lot of, you know, concerns of getting that brood mare to term, having a nice healthy foal, and we don't want to increase the risks, you know, to that mare and that young foal. And as I already mentioned, young horses are just like, you know, kindergarten kids. They are much more susceptible because they don't have the immunity. And often these are our young racehorses or young show horses, and so are also going to be exposed to more disease. Keep them away from especially your pregnant brood mares. So we're going to talk about some diseases of you know, concern that we need to really you know, worry about. And the first one we're going to start with is foot and mouth disease. Now, this is a disease that does not infect horses. And you might say, well, why am I talking about foot and mouth disease if it doesn't affect horses? Because uh, it affects cloven, you know, hooved animals, our cattle, our sheep, our goats, our pigs. Well, the reason we're going to talk about foot and mouth disease first, because if this disease ever is in the United States or North America again, and the last time it was here was back in 1954, our horse industry will stop existing as we know it right now until the disease is contained. This disease is highly contagious. It can blow in the wind, in the dust, for a couple of miles. And when England had their foot and mouth break, or outbreak a number of years ago, it was to the point where you couldn't even walk your dog down the road. So the horse industry is not going to do well if we can't take our horses off to shows, we can't go trail riding, we can't you know, take them to the racetrack, we can't move any animal. And that just is not going to be, you know, very healthy for our industry. So it's really important that we understand that foot and mouth disease is in many, you know, countries and we do our part of making sure we do not bring back any materials that might be contaminated with foot and mouth disease because it would be devastating for the North American economy and especially our horse industry. So we really need to, you know, be diligent uh, about this. Things that are a little closer to home, you know, salmonella. It's uh, an organism that's associated with food poisoning. It's zoonotic, as I'd mentioned already. And zoonotic means that it can affect multiple species. And essentially, every species, you know, can be affected by salmonella, whether you're reptiles or fish or any kind of a mammal, uh, salmonella can be a game player. And again, depending upon which salmonella species we're dealing with, how healthy our animal is, the dose of salmonella that you come in contact with is going to determine whether we have disease occurring or not. And about 1% of normal healthy horses can shed salmonella if we check their feces. But as long as they are normal and healthy and everybody remains healthy, you know, typically is not going to be, you know, a problem. It's not uncommon when we have an outbreak of salmonella to have, you know, it cultured from the grain. And remember, all species can harbor salmonella. And no matter how much feed mills try to reduce the risk of having rats and mice and things in the facilities, it's going to occur. You know, your transport trucks. Here at MSU, a number of years ago with our uh, teaching horses at the veterinary school, we were buying bulk grain and probably the truck that was hauling our bulk grain for us was contaminated and we ended up with uh, a number of our horses developing basically food poisoning and being inappetent and colicky and a little bit of diarrhea. And we were lucky, we never lost any, but it did take a little bit of uh, Sherlock Holmes investigation to figure out what was occurring. And we went from buying you know, bulk grains to bag grains. But even that, we have documented you know, situations where bag grains have been contaminated. So always think about you know, 
salmonella being a player and the fact that it's zoonotic and it can be transmitted by multiple species. A disease that is, you know, for the most part concerned only with horses is strangles. And this disease has been around for, you know, hundreds of years, probably thousands of years, probably ever since the horse existed. And a typical thing we'll see with strangles is, you know, a nasal discharge, as you see in this horse, you know, swelling of the glands underneath the jaw and behind, you know, the jawline, although other things, you know, can, you know, have their lymph nodes increase in size as well. This is an extremely contagious disease. And typically when these abscesses of the lymph nodes break, there's large amounts of purulent you know, discharge. And this discharge is extremely infectious and it can contaminate our you know, blankets, our saddles, our lead shanks, our halters, our water buckets, you know, all of those type of things. So it's really important that if we suspect we have a horse that has respiratory disease, that we really try to isolate these animals and minimize the risk of uh, transmitting from one horse to another. Any horses that are uh, potential of having been exposed should be handled only by a set group of individuals or handled last if you're the only person you know, working with these horses to try and minimize the risk of spreading to the rest of the population. There is, you know, a, you know, a couple of vaccines out there, but like respiratory diseases in humans, the vaccines aren't 100%, but hopefully they provide, you know, some uh, reduction of disease risk. The best thing is quarantining uh, individuals that we think may have been exposed, and the incubation period can be as short as three days or as long as 14 days making sure that we're not the fomite with you know, clothing and boots in our hands, again, the halters and the feed buckets, et cetera. And as we talked about, again, limiting only people that have to be in the barn when we have an outbreak. And I mentioned before, we were gonna talk about other farm animals and strangles. And we had a client many, many years ago who did a really good job of biosecurity. She bought a couple of you know, 4-H horses in for her kids. She had her own population of horses. She had them totally segregated, you know, handled her horses first, handled the new horses last, all of these type of things. And about 10 days after the new horses arrived, her home population came down with strangles and she couldn't figure out what was going on. Well, what we think happened is they had a couple of geese and the geese would go and drink out of the water buckets for the new horses, and they would come down and drink out of the water buckets for the resident population. And so the geese were probably our fomites, something we didn't even think about. So when you have uh, an isolation you know, protocol, not only think about the species you're dealing with, but what other species might be on the property. And for most part, strangles, although it's highly contagious, most horses get the disease, recover, have a reasonably you know, long immunity. We used to say lifelong, it's no longer that, as our horses are living much longer. But there are some you know, pretty severe complications, you know, bastard strangles, where we have abscesses in the lymph nodes occurring other than in the respiratory tract, in the brain, in the intestinal tract, these can be life-threatening, or an immune-mediated you know, problem called purpura hemorrhagica. So even though strangles is you know, typically not a life-threatening disease, it can be in certain situations. And again, for the, you know, the animals that are not as healthy or older, you know, complications are a higher risk. One of the things that's forever in the news, and if you go to uh, the website at the bottom, equine diseases, uh, it will list the number of uh, states you know, areas that are having, you know, concerns with strangles or rhino, also, you know, herpes. The one thing about herpes in all species, you know, herpes is species specific, so human herpes is not gonna affect horses or vice versa, but herpes is forever. And most herpes viruses are present in the horse by the time they're a couple of years of age, and they just lay there latent until something stresses them, and we don't understand all the stressors that can, you know, 
potentiate an outbreak. But when an outbreak occurs, we can have a number of things happening. We can have abortions. The reason to keep your broodmare separate, especially from your young, you know, little fomite young horses and young showing horses. We can have the respiratory disease, which again is not life threatening, but is downtime. And then we can have the neurological disease. And the one thing about vaccination, vaccination will reduce the risk for abortion. It will reduce the risk for developing respiratory disease or severe respiratory disease. It does nothing to prevent neurological disease. And the neurological disease can be you know, caused by both the wild strain of the herpes virus and the mutant strain, although the mutant strain is more likely to cause uh, neurological disease because it causes the virus to replicate, replicate more uh, fervently in the horse and the viremia stays there for a longer period of time. But we just you know, recently had an outbreak in Michigan and it was the wild strain and it was also a closed barn and we have no idea what the stress factor was to initiate an outbreak in this barn. But if you go to this website for equine diseases and you just read down through that, it's you know, uh, surprising, or I shouldn't say surprising, it's kind of eye-opening to see how many facilities. There's a couple of veterinary clinics currently closed because they've had herpes horses present. So in summary, and when we talk about biosecurity in general is we want to use methods to manage disease risk. We want to try and isolate animals if we can, quarantine them when we have new animals coming on property. If we can't do that, at least segregate them to certain areas of the barn and not just randomly mix pregnant horses with young horses, with showing horses try to get exams done on new animals arriving, making sure that they come in with a negative EIA status, a negative Coggins, requiring vaccination, and vaccinations need to be discussed with you know, the veterinarian at the farm and trying to decide what vaccines reduce the risk as much as possible. Just because there's a vaccine out there doesn't mean it necessarily has to be used. It depends upon what your risk factors are. If you're a closed barn and you're not traveling a lot with your horses, then vaccinating for the respiratory diseases may not be something that is not, is not absolutely necessary. The core five vaccines, Eastern, Western, West Nile encephalitis, tetanus and rabies, because these do not require a horse to travel are you know, ones that all horses in North America should have. We've already talked about the importance of fecals and that with increasing parasite resistance, we wanna really try to manage and make sure our horses are you know, treated management-wise as you know, much as possible to reduce the you know, fecal egg count and not rely on you know, dewormers. And above all, you know, try, you know, common sense. You know, when you think about doing something, ask yourself, does this make sense? Am I laying myself open to have a problem with my facility or with my horse by what I'm going to do? And again, if you have, you know, show horses and you enjoy showing, you're going to need to show. Just, you know, we'll talk about some of the things that we can do to reduce risk. So you have your horses, you want to enjoy them, and it's important that you enjoy them. Just try to have a common sense approach to minimizing disease risk. So now we're going to talk about some practical things that we potentially can do you know, with our horses. So at competitions, we want to try and really minimize contact with other horses to as much extent as we possibly can. And if you look at this show facility, this is not a very good way of minimizing disease risk. That horse down there essentially is going to give what it, this horse up here, even though it's about four stalls apart, exactly whatever it has. And they're not only gonna share this way because there's open bars, they're also going to share you know, across the other way. So if you are in a show facility like this, you may want to think about having some 
you know, show curtains that divide off the horses from the other side, you know, plexiglass that, you know, horses can see each other, but don't, you know, physically contact each other from, you know, stall to stall, you know, aspect. If you have just one row of stalls and you have a tack stall, try to situate your tack stall in between a uh, group of horses. These are all your horses and these start somebody else's. Try to put a tack stall here and then some kind of barrier along this line so that these horses are segregated off. If you have a choice when you select your stalls at a show, try to arrange it such that there's less chance of of nose to nose contact from horse to horse. And this also goes when you're sending your horses off to a training facility. Because again, remember I said that young horses are kind of like kindergarten kids. You send them off to a show or you send them off to a training facility and they may all be healthy when they go, but about 10 or 14 days later, they're just like those kindergarten kids. They're all gonna be sick with something to try and minimize that risk. It's nice from a social standpoint for horses to be able to see each other, but in a show facility or a training facility, you may wanna have some kind of a physical barrier between horses so they can't do nose to nose contact. Also, if you're just going to uh, a couple of classes or a day show, even if there's stalls available, maybe you don't wanna use those stalls and just show out of your trailer. If your horse is comfortable, being you know, tied out to the trailer or standing in the trailer for the short period of time you're there, it's going to greatly reduce your disease risk by you know, showing out of the trailer. Don't share grooming and tack equipment. And this is especially hard for 4-H kids because they're always you know, sharing things. And nose-to-nose -nose contact, especially in a ring. If you see 4-H kids out with their horses grazing or whatever, they're busy talking with each other and the horses are busy you know, nose to nose contacting and talking with each other as well, but they're also sharing potentially herpes, you know, strangles, you know, try to minimize this as much as possible. And one of the other things when you're at a show, especially if you have horses that are very social and come up to the stall front, or you have barns, you know, such as this, where the horses hang their head out, is, you know, a passerby going and going, pet this horsey, pet this horsey, down the line, to the next one. And so whatever this horse has is going to be all the way down the line uh, from you know nose petting. So trying to minimize that risk as much as possible. And maybe just having a sign up, you know, please do not pet my horse uh, for biosecurity reasons. Also out on the trail, it's you know uh, important that we also you know think about biosecurity. And if you go trail riding with your friends, these horses may or may not be in you know, normal contact with each other. And if they are in normal contact with each other on a relatively frequent basis, then avoiding nose-to-nose -nose contact isn't as big a deal. But if you just you know, haul in to go riding with somebody and your horses aren't normally in contact, then it's important that you don't allow them nose to nose contact. One of the things is, you know, some facilities or some trail uh, parks and things will have a common water tank. This is not what you want to be doing with your horses. It's very convenient to ride up to this water tank and allow your horses to have a drink. But what happens if one of these horses that's drinking has strangles or herpes or some other you know, contagious disease that's transmitted by contact with contaminated feed or water. And if you know, uh, one of these horses has strangles, and remember I said there's a lot of nasal discharge that you will see when you have strangles, that whole water tank is now contaminated. And it may not be contaminated by any one of these horses. It may have been contaminated by some horse that was here a half hour ago. And the organism is still going to be there. The other thing to think about is if you're going to be, you know, camping out with your horses, is making sure that the picket line that you, you know, picket your horses to is cleaned. Make sure all hay and fecal material 
from the previous horse owners if they weren't you know considerate enough to clean up that you do the cleaning up because again we're thinking about parasites we're thinking about salmonella and trying to minimize the risk you know to our horses if you think your horse has had uh, a chance of being you know uh, exposed to a disease that may be of concern and you're trying to minimize that risk now to your other horses getting sick or potentially you getting sick if it's something like salmonella using disposable gloves is important or at least you know you know having some hand sanitizer you know at that stall so when you've handled that horse you you know sanitize your hands try to you know potentially have some kind of a cover up layer whether it be a lab coat or coveralls or don't handle any of these horses we're concerned about until after we've handled all the other horses on the farm if you have the option again and that horse isn't segregated and nobody else is showing disease at this point in time segregating that horse off using you know uh separate you know boots or foot, foot covers that are you know either reusable or disposable and you know making sure they're cleaned if we're using reusable boots in between you know uses So one of the things that we all think as soon as we've been exposed to uh, some potentially infectious agent is we need to disinfect. We all have this idea we want to disinfect things. And the problem with disinfection is there's a number of agents out there and certain disinfectants are better against certain organisms. However, all disinfectants are not effective if there's organic material present. So the best thing we can do if we've been, you know, or had our facility exposed to some infectious or potentially infectious problem is get rid of organic material. That means all the feces, all the feed, all the bedding really needs to be cleaned out. Anytime you haul a horse for uh, somebody else, a horse that's not typically associated with your facility, you should power wash out your trailer and not just go in and spray a little bleach or whatever your favorite disinfection is or disinfectant is because that only makes you feel better. It really doesn't do anything as far as minimizing the risk of disease. We really need to get rid of that organic material, that feces, that bedding. You know, so taking your car or your trailer down to the car wash and washing it out. Ideally, all our stalls should be impervious to anything soaking into the wood. And if you go to uh, a veterinary clinic, most of the time or a large percentage of the time or horse show facilities, if they are trying to do the best job they can, their stall should be made out of impervious materials. So either metals, cement, you know, plastics uh, that can be easily you know, washed and not have materials like diarrhea or whatever soak into the wood. I, you know, and if, if you're at home, ideally these stalls should be painted and varnished, but it's a big task and it's something you have to keep up on. And in real, you know, realistically, it's not something that is routinely done. However, we still can get in there and really clean off any, you know, fecal material and things off the boards as best we can. And then after we have really adequately cleaned the facility, then you can use a disinfectant. And making sure that the disinfectant you're using is compatible also with the type of cleaning material you use. Certain soaps or detergents will inactivate as well certain disinfectants. So making sure that you've you know, checked and the disinfectant is appropriate for what you're using it for. One of the best disinfectants is sunlight. UV light is great as a disinfectant. In the winter time, and one of the things I didn't put in this presentation as far as diseases, things like ringworm that can really harbor in the cracks and crevices of you know, wood stalls and gates. In the summertime, ringworm is not a concern because of the UV light. So if you've picked up you know, ringworm, it's really hard to get rid of in the wintertime 
once spring comes and we have increasing daylight and UV light, it's you know not going to be a problem anymore. And drying as well is important in you know controlling diseases. Once you've cleaned a stall, if you have the luxury, uh, leave it empty for a couple of weeks. If not, at least leave it empty long enough to you know dry and spraying some kind of disinfectant on an organic surface, if your stalls aren't matted or cemented, is not going to really do anything. It's more important to get it really well cleaned. So what we want to do is protect you and your horse. We want to protect from salmonella, which is you know not only a problem for your horses, but for potentially you as well, especially if you're a high-risk individual or have high-risk individuals in the household. Methicillin-resistant staff, can be a problem with our horses and our other pets as well as us. And you'll hear this talk about MRSA in the news from time to time. Herpes, always a concern because herpes is forever. And at some point in time, there's the potential for this virus to recadesce, to start you know, uh, reproducing in an individual and you know, cause a disease outbreak. Strangles, highly contagious. If uh, we wanted to, we could eliminate strangles. It's harbored as a carrier in the guttural pouch of horses. So if we were to make sure all horses were negative, uh, as far as harboring strangles, we could actually eliminate this disease. But it's something that's not going to occur readily. And again, we just need to you know, talk to your veterinarian about how do I reduce the risk. Composting manure really important because manure is a valuable resource as far as fertilizing our pastures and we want to be able to use it but if we put raw manure on a pasture we're worried about weed seeds parasites bacteria like strangles and salmonella composting really greatly reduces these you know problems and allows us to you know fully utilize its ability to be a fertilizer one of the things that you may want to think about doing when you have a few spare moments is actually going to this website. And if you forget, all you have to do is Google biosecurity and you know, University of Guelph. It's a great way to kind of see how you are actually doing as far as biosecurity. There's you know, essentially 10 areas and you can do it in the privacy of your home. And it allows you to determine, am I doing things well or not doing things well? And often it's a very eye-opening experience because it brings up points you may not even have thought about. And it gives you the results in a very visual manner. And I'm a visual learner. The way it you know, depicts the results is kind of like a traffic light. Green is good. Red is bad. And yellow is kind of marginal. So it will give you a different colored light for each one of these sections. And then it will also talk about what you can do to improve your facility so that if you're in a red, you can at least maybe move up to you know, a yellow, if not a green. So basically what we want to do is realize that an infection control program is not going to eliminate all infectious diseases on your farm. And also we need to realize that just the absolute nature of the horse industry doesn't lend ourselves or allow us to have a biosecurity program with an all in all out kind of a setting like we would have with you know, poultry or swine or some of the other production animals. But we really want to try and at least limit the severity of a problem if we do have a problem or uh, try to have less number of animals affected if a problem occurs. So if an animal comes in with strangles, hopefully it doesn't go through the whole barn. We can limit it to a number of animals. If we have an animal come in you know, with herpes, that we keep it segregated to the young horses that doesn't move over into the brood mares and be a higher risk for abortion. You know, aspects. So really just trying to do different management practices to minimize that risk of animals becoming infected or the number of animals becoming infected.
And if anybody has any questions, since there hasn't been any, you know, to this point in time, I'd be more than happy to, you know, answer your questions. Thank you very much. All right, well, we'll wait a couple minutes here, see if uh, some questions do come in through the Q&A. Uh, but we would like to definitely thank uh, Dr. Martin Luck for taking time out of her schedule to speak with all of us tonight. And thank you to all of you who are online that have joined us. Uh, you will receive an email with an invitation to participate in a brief survey. And I'm actually going to put a link to that survey in the chat as well. So let me, there you go. I just put it up in the chat. You should see a notification in the top left corner of your screen and can click on it. And this is just a very uh, short survey to tell us a little bit about um, tonight's webinar and also to help us plan future webinars as well. Also make sure to become a fan of My Horse University and eExtension Horse Quest on Facebook and you can also follow us on YouTube as well. We'll actually be putting this recording up on YouTube so you'll be able to access it later. Um, and also we'll put it up on our My Horse University website. And I think we do have one question. Come, so that would so that would answer this person's how do I share this webinar? So if it's going to yes. be yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Yep. So um, like I said, we'll send out a link or an email to everyone with a, a link to the recording. But also, if you just simply um, go to our website um, after um, probably Thursday tomorrow late or Thursday, uh, we'll have the recording link up on our website. And one of the other things, if you have questions about biosecurity, your veterinarian is a really good resource in trying to determine how you can best, you know, try to do the best job you, you know, possibly can on your facility. Every farm is an individual and there's generalities that we kind of talked about, but you and your veterinarian can kind of lay out a biosecurity plan for your facility, depending upon how many horses you have, what your facilities are, what you do with your horses, to try and minimize the risk. And that's all we're trying to do, is minimize the risk. We have our horses for fun. If we're so paranoid that we aren't going to do anything with them because we're afraid that something's gonna happen, we're not going to enjoy them. So use common sense, but enjoy your horses. All right, we'll wait here just a minute in case we have, here we go, have another question. And you might want to um, repeat the question. Okay, this uh, person wants to know more about, you know, parasite, you know, uh, deworming control and how to make this affordable to borders since testing had become more expensive than a worming schedule. And yes, maybe initially testing can be more of uh, an expense, but over the long haul, it's actually going to be cheaper. And depending upon how many animals you have in your facility, you can also kind of select horses and do about you know, 10 or 10% 10 of the population, depending upon how many horses are on the facility and select the horses that you would expect to have more problems. Young horses, because their immunity isn't as good yet, are gonna have a higher parasite load. Older horses, uh, sick horses, and figure out who are your, what we call now high shedders, low shedders, and moderate shedders, are low fecal egg shedding horses, or moderate shedding horses, and each veterinarian has a little bit of a different cutoff, for what they consider a low shedder, which is anywhere from a couple hundred eggs per gram to about 500 eggs per gram. And this is for the strongiles, the cyanthostomes primarily. Those horses really only need to be dewormed, you know, once or twice a year. And once you have, you know, figured out who your high shedders are that may need another couple of dewormings a year or, you know, segregation from the, you know, rest of the population, it can really cut down on the amount of deworming. And veterinarians or clients that have done a number of you know, years now of monitoring their horses as far as you know, egg count shedding have found that horses, if they are low shedders, once they become mature, you know, four or five years of age, tend to stay that way. And so those horses 
you may, you know, check them every year or maybe every couple of years to make sure that their, you know, uh, fecal egg count really hasn't changed that much uh, prior to a deworming. Uh, initially, when we're trying to figure out if products work or don't work, you're going to have to figure out how many eggs somebody is shedding, try a dewormer, and then check them 10 to 14 days later. But once you have that part of it worked out, you're down to, as I said, deworming maybe once a year or at most, you know, twice a year for 80 or 90 percent of your horses. And there's only a small population that needs to be dewormed more often. If unfortunately you, I shouldn't say unfortunately because babies are fun, but if you have uh, a broodmare uh, situation where you have a number of foals, ascards become a concern as well. And there are certain drugs that will work for ascarid or big roundworm uh, infestations that may not work for the strongyle infestations and vice versa. And so you need to work closely with your veterinarian to again, develop a program that fits your farm and figure out what drugs work because there's no generalities anymore. It's not like, okay, you have this facility and I can do this. It's kind of, I have this population of horses and I figure out who my high shedders are, who my low shedders are, and you know, who's at major risk and what I can do to you know, reduce that risk. Show horses have a very low risk of having a high parasite egg count. They're in stalls a good percentage of the time. Their stalls are picked on a daily basis. The animals that have you know, typically a higher you know, uh, egg count or problems with parasites are those that are pastured, especially if they're on overgrazed pasture. So it's really, really important to you know, work with your veterinarian to figure out you know, what's the best program. But in the long run, uh, once you figure out what works on your farm, it's actually cheaper than you know, the old way that I would have told you 15 years ago of deworming your horse every four, six, or eight weeks rather than you know, you know, paying for all those dewormers, you can pay for one fecal and you know, one or two dewormings a year. All right, if anyone else has a question, please go ahead and type it in the Q&A. All right, I'm seeing that uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, we would like to once again thank everyone for joining us this evening. And um, once again, thank you, uh, Judy, for uh, giving this webinar tonight. So uh, we'll wait just a second, but um, if we don't have any other questions, we will be ending uh, the webinar here shortly. Once again, please make sure to uh, take a look at our survey that I put a link to in the chat. Uh, we would love to get some of your feedback.